Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. So today, with the scope of my job and getting to see the big picture of the church overall, today I want to give a message all about generosity. Say generosity. generosity. And when we hear this word generosity, the first thing we think is generosity must be linked to finances. But as I began to research generosity and what it truly means both in our normal everyday language as well as biblically, I've noticed that generosity is so much more than financial giving. Watch what the dictionary says for the definition of generosity. Generosity is the quality of being kind and generous. It is the quality of being kind and generous. Now, my whole life, I thought of generosity in terms of a quantity and not as a quality. If I saw that somebody gave away $10,000 and another person gave away $1, I'd say the person that gave away 10000 is way more generous. But in reality, what if somebody gave their last dollar away? Is that not the quality of generosity? Looking into generosity, it's not a matter of how much. It's not something that we do. It's the condition of our hearts. And that's why I'm excited to talk about generosity today. Pastor Mike teaches in the New York Voice Academy. He says, don't you dare limit generosity to your finances. Are you generous with your time? Are you generous in the way that you share with those around you? Are you generous with the gifts that God has given to you? And as we look into scripture, we see a blueprint of how we ought to give and be generous. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, the Bible says this, that each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let's pray this morning. Father, we come to you today in Jesus' name. And Lord, I thank you as we go into this message about generosity and the heart of generosity. God, I pray that we would have the eyes to see and the ears to hear what you're speaking to each of us today. I thank you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's check out a quick video that I think summarizes my sermon today very well. By a show of hands, who here has ever had to recruit people when you're moving your homes? By a show of hands, who's ever had to do all the moving with just you and your family? All right, so there's a 50-50. I heard some pain in that last question when I asked, like, they didn't help me. I help everybody. They didn't help me. If you've ever had to move homes before, you know how it generally works. You've maybe got 20 people that you reach out to and you say, hey, we're moving on this day. Would you, would you be able to help us to move? And most people are like, hey, I'm sorry, you know, my goldfish just be lonely sometimes. He be crying in the tank, so I, I, I'm going to stay with him on that specific day. But if there's ever an, another day where I can ruin my lower back for your sake, please let me know and I will gladly help you to move. The reality is if you can get four people to help you move, you're probably a very good friend. You got your four friends, you move, and you can probably get it done in a day, maybe two. The Amish in this video say, that's cute. That's cute that the four of you can move your furniture into the house. 
We're going to pick this house up and move it into a furniture store, load it up, and move the house back to where it needs to be. What I love about that video is it, it in, my, in my eyes, it kind of categorizes and summarizes this idea that I want to preach from today. Everybody repeat after me. Say, we is greater than me. Let's say it one more time a little louder. Say, we is greater than me. One of my dad's favorite quotes, one of his thousand loud Jamaican quotes, every time we're all moving tables or stacking chairs, he always says, many ons makes light work. <laughs> every, every single time, it's this idea that when we all work together, we can accomplish way more than we ever could on our own. So I want to look into the Bible today because believe it or not, this exact scripture, this exact sermon, this exact idea that we're looking at, that we is greater than me, is something that is in the Bible over and over and over again. So a little bit of context before we jump into this message is that we are preaching from the book of Exodus. Everybody say Exodus. And what we're going to see in this passage today is that there are 12 tribes of Israel. Everybody say 12 tribes. And Israel was being led by a man who was famous for splitting the Red Seas. Red Sea, he's one of the most favorite, famous prophets in the Bible. His name is Moses. And this man Moses leads God's people into the wilderness but now it's time for them to build a church or a tabernacle or a sanctuary. So Moses is going to do a fundraiser. So in Exodus chapter 35 verse 4, it says this. Moses said to all the congregation of the people of Israel. He says, this is the thing that the Lord has commanded. Take from among you the contribution to the Lord. He then says, whoever is of a generous heart, whoever is of a generous heart, whoever is of a generous heart, let him or let them bring the Lord's contribution. So like I said before, I oversee the church finances. And I understand that there is one rule of a fundraiser. Everybody say one rule. The only rule to fundraising is get as much money as you can from as many people as you can with any means necessary. The normal way to do a fundraiser, just take, 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 take. Watch people. Hey, hey where are you going? You didn't put anything in the offering plate. Come, come back here. Come back here and give. But here, Moses does something that you would never do in a fundraiser. He says, only those who are of a generous heart should give to what we're building. Moses is adding conditions onto who should give. And this is a very weird thing to see in the world today. I've never seen a commercial that says, donate only if your heart is connected to this. Know what you see, donate, donate. We'll take it from anyone and from anywhere. In our modern day setting, we don't really care about where the money comes from. Just give me the money. But we see here that Moses, as he's led by the Spirit of God, says, don't just take from everyone. He says, those who are giving, they should feel a stirring in their heart that they're supposed to be a part of what God is doing right here. And when we look into the Hebrew word that was written in Scripture to describe a generous heart, it is the word leb. Everybody say leb. If you're taking notes, that's L-E-B. And this word refers to the inner man, to the mind, to the will, and to the heart. So Moses is saying, anybody here of a generous inner man, of a generous mind, of a generous will, of a generous heart, those people are to help build what God is doing here. Now notice, it's not a matter of everybody bring the same amount. It's not a matter of everybody has to do something. 
He's simply saying, if you feel in your heart to be a part of what's happening here, then you should give. What I love about this scripture is giving us a very clear picture of the heart of God. That generosity is not something that should happen because we feel pressured. But generosity should flow out of the goodness of our hearts. Generosity is not something that we should be doing out of guilt. Generosity should be something that we're doing out of our goodness. If you've ever been watching a a TV show or a movie, a nice happy movie with your family, you know that some of these commercials be putting pressure on you to give. For example, you're watching a comedy, everyone's having a great time laughing, and then all of a sudden, you hear the music. In the arms of the angels, I'm here with little Kokomo. (laughs) Kokomo would die out on the streets. But good thing you have money and you can give to save Kokomo's life. Be a good person and save Kokomo. Or not, you don't have to. And it's like, man, you feel pressure to give. Little Kokomo been dead for seven years. They didn't tell you that, but that pressure is there to give. And we can compare the pressure to give with what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. It says, you must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. Don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. I remember growing up, my dad watched a lot of Christian TV. And sometimes you would fall asleep on the couch and you'd wake up at like 2 a.m. And there'd be someone there like, God's going to bless you right now if you give a gift of $1,000. I'm going to count down from three. God's going to bless you too. And it's this overwhelming pressure. Do not give in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. When you give, it should be with a smile, not with a, mm. It should never be with a heart of, I have to do this. It should always be the heart, I get to do this. What's my point in saying all of this? That God values the heart of generosity more than he values a generous action. I'm going to say that again for the person in the back. God values the heart of generosity more than he values a generous action. What does that mean? It means you can give with an open hand and a closed heart. It means you can give to others, not out of the cheer and out of the goodness, but you can be giving out of obligation. It's like giving to someone that's on the street and thinking to yourself, they better not buy drugs with my money. That's not the heart of generosity. That's the heart of judgment. The heart of generosity says, even if they were going to buy drugs, I'm still going to love them in that state. Even if they were going to go and do something that I don't think is right, I still have a heart that overflows to share with those who are around me. I remember one day I was teaching the students about the importance of giving cheerfully and giving with a happy heart. And I asked them, okay, now that we understand cheerful giving, would God rather you give a dollar with a happy heart or give $10,000 angrily? And what did the kids say? $10,000! I was like, thank you, but no, you're missing it. It's all about the cheerfulness in our heart. And as Moses lays out this idea in Exodus to the 12 tribes, that each person should give as their heart is stirred, he gives them some materials that they needed for the building. But then he takes it a step further. In verse 10, Moses says, let every skillful craftsman among you Come and make that all that the Lord has commanded. In other words, we see at the beginning, he's asking for the finances to build this. But Moses realizes 
that a pile of money is not going to build a building. He realizes that a pile of yarn is not going to form itself into the garments that they needed. That a pile of gold is not going to overlay itself. So Moses is saying, I don't just need those that have finances. He's saying, I need those with God-given gifts to come and use those gifts to build what we're doing here. He's saying that God's not just looking for the gifts that we carry in our pockets. He's also looking for the gifts that he's given us. He's also looking for the gifts that he's placed on the inside of us. I want to ask you today. What gifts has God placed on the inside of you? What gifts has God placed on the inside of you? Every single person in this room has a gift from God. When you look throughout the Bible, God never gives gifts for us to keep to ourselves that the gifts are often many times for the people that we're connected to. And I think some of us are connected to people around us, and we don't count that as a gift. I think some of us are sitting here, and we say, I, I have nothing to add. All I do is I just sit at my desk, and everyone comes and shares their problems with me. Um, hello, what a gift. What a gift. I don't have a gift. I, I just smile and people say it brightens their day. Hello. What a gift. What a gift that somebody can be having a horrible moment and in a second of seeing your smile be snapped out of it. What a gift. When it comes to our generosity, I need us to understand that it's not just finances that we have the opportunity to be generous with, but we have the opportunity to pour into the people that God has surrounded us with. One thing that's always been important to me is that I grew up in this church from the second grade. And in this church, I've had probably over 20 mothers. I've had over 20 fathers. I've had so many grandparents. Looking out into the audience, much of my church family is sitting here today. That was helping me in second grade. Joshua, please sit down. J sit down. <laughs> the people that were pouring into me year after year after year after year. Yes, I'm standing today on a platform that is made out of concrete but I'm also standing on the platform of the people that poured into me. I'm standing here on this stage because people like you in the audience decided that I was important enough to pour into, to speak life into, to encourage as a young man as I grow up, grew up, I want to show you a picture today of the last Metacon that we had. Now, I was talking to people after service and like, where are you in this picture? You see the pine bush, the hoodie, around 120 pounds soaking wet? That's me right there. But who am I standing next to? Pastor John Mark. This is 11 years ago. And who is he holding on to? Rayvon, who is playing the drums today. So 11 years ago, Pastor John Mark was pouring into us. 11 years ago, Pastor Mike was pouring into us. And because they decided to pour into me, I'm standing here on the stage today. That is exactly what we see in generosity with our gifts. Before I came to church today, I had to iron my clothes. Guess where I learned how to iron my clothes? Pastor John Mark saw me ironing at this event. He's like, what are you doing? Come here, come here, come here. You got to stretch it and then you got to lean it over the, the edge. I was just trying to use the flat part. I was an absolute amateur. And he taught me exactly how to iron my clothes. And I ironed the exact same way to this day. I want you to understand 
that when you're pouring your gifts into people, it's not just that you're pouring a finished product, but you're pouring seeds that will grow and grow and grow and grow. We are standing here today on the stage, me, myself, me, myself, and I, <laughs> me, Pastor John Mark, and Ray Vaughn because of people like you. I need you to understand today that money is not the greatest resource in this room. You are the greatest resource in this room. And my first point, or my second idea today, is your gift is not insignificant. Repeat after me, say, my gift is not insignificant. Say, my gift is not insignificant. I clicked on this word insignificant real quick, and it's an adjective or a describing word that means too small or unimportant to be of any worth. Too small or unimportant to be any worth. How many times do we view ourselves or the gifts that God has given to us as too small or unimportant to be of any worth. I want you to know something today. That 2,000 years ago, that the most significant blood in human history was poured out on a cross. And that blood of great value was poured out for each person in this room today. And not only was that blood poured out, but Jesus Christ was raised from the dead with power over death, hell, and the grave. Not only did he rise from the dead, he sent somebody to be our advocate, to be our helper, to be our comforter. And that eternal comforter lives on the inside of you. So let me ask you something. If all of that happens, and the eternal God is living on the inside of you, how is it possible that you or your gift is too small or unimportant to be of any worth? It does not make any logical sense. I need you to understand today that the gifts that God has given to you, starting with this gift called life, is something that is a gift that we can share with those around us and be generous with. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, the Bible says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's grace. Being a good steward means that God has entrusted you with something and that you're using it for the purpose in which he gave you. Let me ask you something. If I gave you a bottle of medicine, and I told you that there was a child out in the lobby dying if they didn't get this medicine, what would you do with that medicine? Some of you are like, I, I'd walk out and give it to them. Nope, you'd be like, whoosh. If I don't get this medicine to this child, this child is going to die. I need you to understand that your gift is a medicine, that the world needs what God has placed on the inside of you, that your smile, your generosity, your eye contact, your listening, your kindness, your joy, your peace, your patience, these little insignificant gifts can be the thing that sets somebody free. There are no insignificant gifts with God. There are no insignificant people with God. As we look through this story, and as we saw in the video with the Yamish, that when people are stirred in their heart to give and simply follow their heart, they don't have to do more than what was in their heart. They don't have to one-up what was in their heart. When they simply followed what was in their heart, watch what happens in the rest of our story. It says in Exodus 36, verse 3, and I'm going to paraphrase this section, that the people 
kept bringing Moses free will offerings every day. Everybody say free will offering. Now, in the old covenant, there were offerings that were required. Things that people had to do in order to be a part of God's uh, people of Israel. But the free will offering was simply whatever you felt in your heart is what you're to give. This is the only offering that translates from the old covenant into the new. Giving was always centered around the heart. In verse 4, it says that the people went to Moses that were working on the sanctuary. And they said, Moses, and this is all the builders, they said, the people are bringing way too much. You need to tell them to stop. Verse 7, it says this, that the people, they were restrained from building for the material they had was sufficient to do all the work and more. All the work and more. Church, when we each follow our heart as it is stirred by God, I want you to understand that together we are able to do all the work and more. That we can see people set free from addictions and more. We can see broken hearts mended and more. We can see kids sponsored off to camp and more. There are so many things that can happen when we come together because we is greater than, than me. When all God's people followed their hearts, it was more than enough to do what God had created them to do. We is greater than me. And some of you are sitting here and you're saying, ah, cool, cool sermon about the gifts, but I've got nothing to add. Some of us are here today saying, if you knew my past, you would never ask me to serve. If you knew my past, you'd want to keep me away from as many people as possible. Well, I want you to know today that if you saw your future, how God sees your future, your past was preparing you for where God was taking you. The very thing that you think disqualifies you is the very thing that God will use to reach those who are around you. When we look in the book of Acts in the Bible, and we see that Peter, a fisherman, is preaching in synagogues with people who studied the Bible from the time, essentially from they were born for 50, 60, 70 years. The Bible says in Acts that they were amazed that they were unschooled men teaching them. The fact that they weren't schooled was the very thing that God used to reach those who were schooled. It's easy to think my lack is what's stopping God from using me. When in reality, God says that's the very thing I'm going to use to set somebody else free. This is the kingdom of God. And I want to close with this simple idea today. We see in verse 31 of our story that there's a man named Bezalel. He was the son of Uri and the son of Hur. And the Bible says that God has filled him with the spirit of God, with skill, intelligence, with knowledge, with all craftsmanship. In the book of Acts chapter 4, it says that when God's people had prayed, the place in which they were gathered was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak the word of God with boldness. Acts chapter 2, verse 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What's my point today? That we are not walking around powerless. We are not serving those around us powerless. 
but that the very same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells on the inside of you. Let me ask you, if you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that God was going to use you this week to help somebody else, what would you do? If you believed by faith that God could use little old you to bless somebody and to help somebody, what would that look like today? As we were meeting as a staff earlier before the year started, we began to outline all the events and all the things that we felt that God was calling us to do. And as I was reading through this very same story, I designed something called the Power of 12 Initiative. Everybody say Power of 12. And in reading this story, I was so inspired that when people followed their heart, that it was more than enough to do what God had created them to do. And what I wanted to do was take this number 12 because Jesus had 12 disciples. There were 12 tribes of Israel, and 12 happens to be my favorite number anyways. And I wanted to say, how many ways can we work this number 12 so that we can give from our hearts? So I want to ask you, if it was financially, could you give 12 cents a month if you've never given before? Could you give $12 a month if you've never given before? Maybe it's $12 a week or $12 a day for some people. If it's $12 a minute, I'm going to give you my Venmo because please, hook a brother up. At least half of that, right? With your time, can you call somebody and tell them that you love them if it was to take 12 seconds? Can you spend 12 minutes on the phone with somebody that you haven't talked to for a while? If you feel that your kids are missing you, could you take 12 hours to spend some time with them? Could you serve here at the church 12 times a year? Can you help in the children's ministry for 12 hours a month? They have this classroom called the two and three-year-olds down there. If you've ever heard of a, com of a combat zone, right in there, you walk in, the kids like, ah! They might need you for 12 hours a month down there in the children's ministry. Whatever it looks like for you today, here's my final point. That you must each decide in your heart how much to give. And do not give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. The most important thing today is not the amount that you contribute, it's the heart that you have of contribution. I want to encourage you and challenge you today that if you felt as I was speaking that there's something in your heart that was stirring somebody to contact, something to give towards, I want to encourage you, don't let that feeling go and to follow your heart and to give. Because when all of God's people give what's in their heart, we have, we are sufficient and able to do even more. At the end of the day, no matter who you are, when we all come together, we all know that we is greater than me. Let's pray today. Father, we come to you today in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray for anyone that's hearing my voice right now that feels isolated and disconnected not just in church, but in life in general, God. I thank you, Lord, that you would give them the courage and the confidence to reach out and ask for help. Not in a moment of weakness, God, but in a moment of strength. The strength to reach out and ask for help. Lord, I pray if there's anybody in this room that feels invisible, that feels unheard, that feels misunderstood, God, that your Holy Spirit in this moment would comfort them, would remind them that you're here with us, leading us and guiding us. 
Lord, I pray as we go in a heart of generosity out these doors, that our hearts would be stirred to follow what you've created us to do. I thank you for these things. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We always love to pray a second prayer here at Family Church, and this is what we call the prayer of salvation. If you feel like today is the day where you want to give your life over to Jesus and you've never done that before, we all say a prayer together. Repeat after me. Say, Dear God, I come to you today just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I believe that you died and rose for me. Come into my heart. Come into my life to change me and make me new. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. You can head on over to familychurchny.com or email us at team at to get started today.